Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing uh, the latest instalment in Todd and Dane's Indie Read Along. So if I'm correct, this is the January video, probably out in about March, knowing my current approach to making videos, but I'm getting there. And I'm going to be reviewing two more Ollie Jacobs Kirk Sandblaster books, so I'll link below to my last video where I discussed uh, three of them in the series. So uh, he's a local High Wycombe author, I actually went round to his house for a party and he gave me three of his books in this series. And so I thought I might as well buy the final remaining two that he didn't have spare copies of. So the Kirk Sandblaster books are a little bit reminiscent of Douglas Adams, they're basically Humorous sci-fi, they follow the titular character, Kirk Sandblast, a space adventurer. He's a bit of an arrogant douche, to be honest. He's kind of a character you love to hate. And then he has his sidekick, Zla, who has two heads and a power suit. And um, Zla is much more kind of cynical and is just brought along for the ride and doesn't always want to be there. <laughs> and uh, it's just got this great sort of, it's got this British sense of humour, I think. I also like in quite a few places, he references, like, areas and things that are kind of native to High Wycombe where I live, you know. So I'm going to start by taking a look at this one. So this is The Space Adventures of Kirk Sandblaster Space Adventurer. This is the first book in the series. I'll read the blurb. Adventure! That's Kirk Sandblaster's mantra. In a universe filled with the wild and wonderful, he's looking for his next fix. Along with his Zarian sidekick, Zla, Kirk Sandblaster is ready to zip, zoom and laugh in the face of most things. Strap in, have a beverage, and get ready for the space adventures of Kirk Sandblaster, space adventurer. Well, I would not be one to deny the beverage. So, as I say, this is the first book in the series. You can kind of tell uh, in the as the series progresses, the uh, the editing in particular and the copy editing gets a lot better. So things like apostrophes being in the wrong places and that kind of stuff uh, happens more kind of frequently towards the start. That said, it is a great introduction to the world of Kirk Sandblaster. It did. I don't want to say it annoyed me, but it was a bit jarring for me in that it jumps backwards and forwards through time because basically what happens is you start at this certain point in the story and then the AI, the onboard AI called Navi on, on his uh, spaceship, is kind of telling the story of how him and Zla met, which is an important story, but it's just weird a little bit how it's done that it jumps from the sort of the present back to the past and then back to the present, back to the past again. But it does work well. I will read you uh, a, few, a few things that I... I uh, highlighted here. Now I will say, again, I think it's because I read these out of order, I would suggest reading them in order. Because basically this ho whole thing felt like backstory to me. Because it basically was, because I'd read the next three books or whatever, where Zlar is already a character. And this is very much introducing Zlar and Kirk Sandblaster and, you know, building the universe. And uh, speaking of which, the, the world building, which is actually universe building in this, Fantastic, like very imaginative. Even some of the place names are just like the place names have got a kind of humor of their own to them as well. Oh, yeah, so here we go. This will be uh, uh, recognizable to anybody from the UK, this place name. Uh, Whizzing through the majesty of space, Sam Blaster knew exactly where he was going. Back in his GAF days, swigging Cartarellis with the lads before slinking off and letting them pay the bill, they often spoke of the home of the lost pilots. It was a place where maverick flight smiths went to perish on the wave of their own legacy. Burnt out, stretched thin and hung out to dry. They were any willing captains for a price. And the price wasn't cheap. After all, these outcasts had all come for a reason and were usually willing to stay. That place, the floating bastion of jaded hope and lost souls. Space Station Hull. No offence to any of my viewers who may be from Hull. I like this little paragraph here as well. So, uh, since then, the art of transwarpers have still been mired in controversy and casual wariness. In fact, many psychopaths have accepted transwarper phobia as a serious, recognisable condition. At this juncture, it should be noted that psychopaths are not, in fact, the mad axe murdering type that history defined them as, but a portmanteau of psychologists and telepaths who exceed in the field. Oh yeah, I like this bit as well. It breaks the fourth wall. Let me read this bit out. So this builds directly on from that, and because uh, this is the computer telling the story, and then we jump back to the present. Sam Blaster and Zla gave each other a befuddled look. On the Gurian ship, the dual-faced pirates gave themselves an equally confused one, which given their multi-faced status was very confusing indeed. Navi, why did you feel the need to clarify that? Sam Blaster asked. Well, sir, just in case some non-future type person was listening in. What do you mean, non-future type? I mean someone who is not from this exciting science fictional world. This isn't science fiction though, you dumb piece of technology, Zla growled. Maybe so, but someone could be reading this and won't know all of these ram, ram damn diddly future terms. 
Apologies if the camera angle has changed, my battery just died. One thing I do like here as well, just this little tiny bit of attention to detail. So uh, basically they've just recovered this map from outer space. And uh, it goes, As the Zarian crashed back into the relative safety of the bounty, Sam Blaster grabbed the map. He instantly wished he hadn't, as it was fairly frozen from being out in deep space. He swiftly dropped it to the floor and dunked his hands in some thermal aqua. We have this bit where they get into a super bright sun as well, so... Uh, they, they get up to a, well, they tint the, uh, they keep tinting the uh, screen of the ship so they can see it. And uh, it says, at 5,000% tint, he finally managed to get a good look at the mega sun that was before him. Sure enough, it was the largest surface he had ever seen, with no hint of an edge to it, no matter where he looked. What amazed him further was the fact that periodically, little black dots would pass by, small enough to be almost insignificant, but exactly all the, but noticeable all the same. Sam Blaster knew exactly what the dots were. They were planets. We also have the moment in this story where Zla loses his eye and uh, it gets replaced by a robotic one, which uh, is then mentioned in the later books as well. I'm going to give this, uh, I'm going to give this a 3.75 out of 5. Actually, going back through it now, I, I did enjoy it more than I remembered enjoying it. So that there's, that's always good. And we move on to this one here, which is Kirk Sandblaster plays the game of Loria, and the blurb for this: Boom! Despite the exploding glory of Universia, Kirk Sandblaster is bored. So what's a space adventurer to do? Sign up for the most dangerous, exciting tournament there is, and bring along Zla for the ride. So once again, strap yourself in and grab your lasers because Kirk Sandblaster plays the game of Loria. And the game of Loria is basically like a battle royale with non-deadly lasers, except there are also some very deadly explosions, so it's not all kind of safe. The reason Kirk Sandblaster wants to do it is for the promise of adventure, because that's the kind of guy he is. There's also a big old prize if you win it, but he's not too worried about that, because for Reasons that I'm still not quite entirely certain of. He is like a tetrillionaire. He's very rich. And this, this is on par with uh, Kirk Sandblaster faces Tetragedon, which I reviewed in the last batch that I read. Those two are probably my favourite of the series so far. I think they're also probably the later ones as well, which, you know, potentially makes sense. I also know that Ollie's recently finished work on a new one, and there might be a sixth one that I haven't got yet as well, so... I might wait till that, that new one comes out and then we'll do it. We'll do an update. We'll do a third video on this series. Here we have another one of the great names as well. So there's Space Station Risborough. So the planet Loria is where the actual game is held. And Space Station Risborough, I believe, orbits that planet. And it has the medical bay and all that stuff. And basically people get shot by the lasers in this game. And uh, then they're like airlifted out by drones and taken to the medibay. Because they're paralyzed once they're hit. Uh, only temporarily. So that's good. But um, Space Station Risborough is presumably named after Princess Risborough, which is about, I don't know, 10, 15 miles from here. I like this little observation as well. So basically, because this is an actual planet that it's take, taken place on, the planet, it, you, get, you get explained this as part of the, you know, the backstory of the book, but the planet was kind of colonized and then abandoned. So there's like lots of abandoned buildings there, which is perfect for you to have this game of Loria, you know? So uh, it says here, Zlar wanted to be in the thick of the action, not playing babysitter, but knew that Fip would be useless on his own. He picked up the Ulian and ran to the hole that Bronx Rocket had caused. It had opened up a small series of offices filled with mechanical equipment and motivational posters. One, showcasing a cat dangling precariously from a piece of wire, told Zlar to hang on in there. Part of him wanted to shoot it. I like this bit as well, so uh, Sam Blaster's facing off against his, his sort of nemesis for this book. And uh, the, the bit that you need to know going into this is that the company that runs it all is called Alpha Sports. So uh, this, this enemy, he goes, well, let's, let's read this bit. Here we go. You know your problem, Bronk. Bronk just shook with rage. He was snorting hard now, swinging his limp limbs around with such ferocity that should they connect, they'd still probably knock you out clean. I'm gonna break you, Sam Blaster! Exactly, that's your problem. You're so caught up in getting revenge, you lost sight of the game itself. I mean, what did you think this was? Vengeance Island? At that moment, Alpha Sports went into copywriting the term Vengeance Island and planned to have its first season premiere next month. So there is there's some great commentary on like corporate culture in this as well. Oh, there is a there is a typo in this that did make me chuckle a bit. It says you wouldn't you couldn't fault them for ceasing the moment instead of seizing the moment. But again, I mean it's an indie book. You 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 gotta cut it some slack, you know. Here we have a start of one of the chapters as well. So uh, as the Alpha Sports Recovery Center hold toward the dusty ground of Sector F, Kirk Sandblaster and his Zarian comrade Zla could only watch as certain doom looked at them straight on. Now, doom can come in all flavours, of course, but this was an impressive level of doom. You can get mild doom, or even a spot of heavy doom, but certain doom, that was very dooming. 
And then we have a reference to uh, Montague Santiago as well and the uh, University of Man of the Year competition, which uh, I'm not sure whether that's already happened by this point, because again, I read them out of order, but there is, a, there is a book about that. So I think it goes, yeah, the Space Adventures of Kirk Sandblaster, Space Adventurer, Kirk Sandblaster and the Ice Pirates of Lure, Kirk Sandblaster plays the game of Loria, Kirk Sandblaster faces Tetrageddon, and then Kirk San... Kirk Sandblaster versus Montague San Santiago is number five, I think. So there's a nice little bit of foreshadow in there. All in all, I give this a pretty solid four, if not a 4.25 out of five. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed both of these. I've enjoyed all of the books so far. Some of them are better than others, but you get that in a series. And because of like, if you look at them, they're not particularly massive books. So you can kind of binge on them pretty easily as well, as I did. I've read uh, five of them in two months now, I believe. And I, I look forward to reading some more. And, uh, yeah, I've read some of uh, Ollie Jacobs' other stuff as well, and we're just, yeah, he's a good guy and a good author, so I'd recommend it. So there we have it. That is it for this month's edition of Tarden Danes Indie Read Along. I'm not quite sure what I'll be reading in the month of February yet, but it's chances are it's probably going to be Strange Day. Uh, no, sorry. It's, chances are it's going to be West Richardson Street by Shakib Deshmukh, who is another High Wycombe author. That's why I was thinking Strange Days in High Wycombe, which is an Ollie Jacobs book. Um... Yeah, I'll probably read that and maybe some Duncan Ralston as well, who I've read before, who writes some horror. But as always, feel free to join us. All you really have to do to take part is read an indie book each month, or more if you would like to. And uh, check out Todd the Librarian as well. Shout out to Time for Books, who has joined us, I think, every month since we started and is uh, probably doing a better job at this point than either me or Todd are. She should be the third host, really. Uh, but yeah. It is what it is. So on that note, thanks as always for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you're going to be checking out the Kirk Sandblaster books or indeed any of Ollie Jacobs' stuff or anything by an indie author. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.